Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to Our Curious Amalgam, the podcast from the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. My name is Christina Ma, and today's topic is What's Behind the Scenes? Changes to Merger Control in China. In October 2021, broad and sweeping amendments to China's anti monopoly law were submitted to the National People's Congress for consideration. In this episode of Our Curious Amalgam, we'll explore the key proposed changes to the law and what it means for antitrust enforcement in China going forward. Joining me today is my co-host, Anora Wang. Hey, Anora. Hi, Christina. Welcome back. So China's merger control, why are we talking about this now? Well, as you said, it's a time of change. A lot of things are uh, happening uh, and behind the scenes. It's really hard to read uh, the tea leaves from the outside, and it's really important for people who do care and who is watching closely to learn it from someone who might have some intimate knowledge of the ins and outs. Great. And who is our guest today? Our guest, Janet Hui, is a partner at the Jinghe Law Firm's Hong Kong office. She's actually currently based in Beijing. Janet uh, specializes in cross-border antitrust, M&A, foreign investment, and general corporate matters. Janet is a well-recognized and top-ranked practitioner with more than 30 years' experience in providing legal services to clients in various industries, like telecommunications, media, semiconductor, you just name it. Uh, previously, Janet had experience working as in-house uh, counsel in multinational companies in Hong Kong for I believe, more than seven years. And Janet uh, is really just re- very re- well recognized and known for her extensive knowledge in assisting clients defend antitrust investigations and forming antitrust compliance programs in China. And, and why we have her here is really for her <laughs> knowledge of things and outs of China merger control, which is really a much sought after asset in a time of change like now. Great. Well, Janet, we're um, very excited to have you and thank you for joining today. Welcome. Thank you. I'm also very excited to talk to you. Pleasure is ours, uh, Janet. Uh, let's start with several high-level questions. As Christina previewed, China antitrust in general, not just merger control, is really changing now. And one of the main uh, source of change changes is the law itself. And, and then perhaps restru- restructure of agencies and personnel is another major source, but we just don't know much about it. So uh, let's start with, with the law itself. Um, the the anti monopoly law, right? That's the Chinese. Uh, that's the main law for the Chinese antitrust regime. And what 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 is being talked about changing it now? Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Anora. I think uh, there are a couple of uh, I mean important changes that we anticipate to come with the amendment to the uh, anti monopoly law. Uh, the first one is that uh, I mean there's a great emphasis uh, focus on the tech side. Uh, under the uh, uh, draft amendment uh, published in uh, uh, 2021 uh, in October, actually uh, the spotlight uh, came to the tech internet sector because uh, there was a special provision setting out that the business operators are prohibited from abusing data, algorithms, techniques, advantages in the capital and rules of the platform in order to eliminate and restrict competition. So it seems that uh, the internet and digital economy will remain as the main focus of the Chinese uh, antitrust enforcement. Uh, And that's why there was a special provision uh, being inserted to the amendment of the law. Uh, And of course, at the same time, I mean, some general provision also mentioned technology uh, and uh, some traditional uh, business uh, that may be uh, subject to uh, the focus, like the people Staying in necessity, uh, the finance, the media, etc. But still, it seems that uh, I mean the online platform economy is the, the focus of the attention. Mm. And merger is our focus today. But like beyond that, right? The whole focus on tech is really uh, from all angles. And and you mentioned in the proposed amendment, and which is probably likely going to be adopted sometime soon. Uh, obviously, we're, we're we're speculating. But if that that goes through. 
the whole focus on on te uh, technology. Could you just, uh, I perhaps let's let's do Article Ten to what, one more time. What what does it say again? Uh, algorithm technology and and advantages in capital. They're all going to be a focus of enforcement uh, of antitrust. Yeah, I think uh, the um, main focus would be, uh, I mean, all those uh, behaviors are not allowed uh, by, um, I mean, uh, focusing that uh, it should not affect the TED uh, or the uh, online platform uh, operation. So, um, I mean, they are prohibited from abusing the data algorithm techniques. And at the same time, I think there's a Chinese term that we always say is uh, taking advantage of the capital. Uh, and uh, have that sort of an uncontrolled expansion. So what it means is that I think the Chinese authority has seen uh, that a lot of capital investment has been made on the online platform company, uh, which allowed them to grow to be, um, I mean, conglomerates, uh, which, um, I mean, uh, together with the abuse of their dominant market position and together with the algorithm, the high tech, etc., uh, has made them become so big uh, that it seems to be out of control. And at the same time, it seems that using the antitrust law uh, to tackle those issues and uh, make them, say, uh, comply with more the uh, normal behavior and not to uh, engage in anti-competitive behavior uh, seems a direction uh, and a mission under the antitrust mm -hmm. law. And and let's then focus on merger a little bit. What what are the significant changes that are, that are proposed to be adopted into the anti-monopoly law? Yeah, thank you. I think for the merger, um, you may have seen uh, that uh, there are a lot of uh, I mean uh, decisions uh, published by the current regulator, Anti-Monopoly Bureau, uh, for gun jumping and failure mm -hmm. to file. And you will see that uh, I mean uh, even with less than four percent as a minority shareholder, may be regarded to has gained joint control over a company, and so uh, is subject to that's a failure to file or gun jumping the maximum amount of fine uh, for five hundred thousand. But in fact. Due to the significant increase of the penalty amount in the amendment, uh, there has been a lot of uh, that sort of retrospective filing that being done. Because the most significant change is that the amount of five hundred thousand renminbi will be increased to ten times of the penalty uh, after the amendment uh, becomes effective for transactions that do not have anti-competitive effect. But for th those transactions that may have anti-competitive effect, we're talking about increasing the amount of fine up to 10% of last year's sales revenue. So this kind of significant increase of the penalty amount uh, has become uh, a big concern. Uh, and that's why uh, there has been a lot of transactions rushing in to do this kind of retrospective uh, filing. Mm -hmm. uh, the other significant uh, change is that, uh, I mean, in addition to um, the increase of the fine, there is a catch-all provision to say that in case that any transaction that is so mm -hmm. serious uh, and has, uh, I mean, adverse consequences, mm -hmm. then the authority yeah. had the right to impose the fine, uh, increasing it by two to mm -hmm. five times. So in other words, the maximum amount of the fine for gun jumping or failure to fine could maximum up to 50% of last year's revenue. Um, I mean, it creates a lot of uncertainty and yeah, worries. Exactly, and and probably a little controversial. And what is serious, right? Who in 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 the beholder's eyes, right? Mm -hmm. And and apparently mm -hmm. the proposed amendment doesn't really spell it out. And do you expect the agency uh, to come out with uh, guidance on what they consider uh, as a serious case that they would increase the fines? Um, not at the moment. Um, I think this provision has uh, caught a lot of uh, that sort of concern. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they are looking at that. But even if they do not have that sort of guidance, I think uh, based on the past experience, um, they probably will create precedent mm -hmm. case in order to give interpretation as to what may constitute serious adverse consequences. Mm -hmm. That that makes sense. And uh, while we're on the topic of the amendment, let's just cover uh, monopoly agreements and abuse of dominance, which are the two other major types of conduct being regulated uh, as well. So what, what are major changes uh, that would be uh, probably amended, like you know, adopted into the amended law? 
Yeah, thank you. Maybe we cover the um, I mean, anti-competitive agreement, monopoly mm -hmm. agreement first. The first one that came into place is the pub and spoke conspiracy. It was mentioned in the online platform guidelines, but it was not uh, formally set out in the law. And so the amendment also covers that sort of hub and spoke. So the organizers, uh, which assists um, other third parties to enter into cartel agreement will also subject to a fine of 1 to 10% of last year's revenue. Uh, so the organizer will not be left out. The second one is uh, more the concept also adopted in the uh, previous Octomobile Antitrust Guideline, the Safe Harbor System. Uh, it was not in place in the antitrust law formally, uh, and at the same time, the amendment also talks about a safe harbor rule may be introduced uh, with the aim to assist the small to medium-sized enterprises uh, that uh, they would be able to do that sort of self-assessment, uh, and hopefully that would avoid the antitrust risk. Uh, but for the safe harbor rule, I think one thing that's not clear is whether that would be applicable to the hardcore restrictions, which would believe should not be the case. Uh, but there's an uh, ambiguity in this regard. And so we hope the next round of the draft or the past amendment law will clarify this so provision. So where are we, like, you know, in the process? Uh, do you think this is close to the final draft, Given uh, even though there are several provisions that, you know, really... Uh, to some very controversial and concerning? Or do you think it, there is probably another uh, round of draft and comment to go for, for the amendment of the law? Uh, we, yeah, thank you. We believe that there may be uh, some uh, comments that we can still uh, submit uh, because it has just collected uh, all the comments publicly. Uh, but we heard that it might be passed in the next uh, first quarter of 2022. Uh, so we do not know how much uh, accommodation they can give for uh, further changes to be uh, suggested. Uh, but again, I think uh, for those things that are wet or unclear, uh, then it's probably like the safe harbor system. Uh, it may subject to further regulations mm -hmm. to come up. So hopefully that's better. And uh, just one last point that I would like to mention, which is important, is the personal liability. Because in the current law, uh, except for obstructing the investigation, there's no personal liability. But under the amendment law, uh, the legal representative and all major person in charge and responsible for the anti-competitive violations will be subject to personal penalty up to B 1 million. So hopefully that would be a deterrence uh, for the key persons uh, to proactively, uh, I mean, initiate uh, that sort of anti-competitive behavior or organize mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And then we might as well cover the procedural changes a little bit, but maybe uh, briefly, what do you think is significant uh, that's related to merger? Yeah, the merger one is, um, I mean, the stop mm -hmm. the clock system, which caused quite a bit of worries among the practitioners because uh, SEMA said they can suspend the review uh, if the company uh, fails to submit uh, material documents and, uh, uh, and uh, information which affected the review process. Or there may be new situations occurred that have significant impact on the review, or there may be a need uh, to assess uh, the uh, remedies uh, to be imposed. I think the stop the clock, uh, I mean, they would like to eliminate uh, the issue about the pro and refund, which occurred to quite a number of, um, I mean, mm -hmm. conditional approvals. But at the same time, the stop the clock also caused concern that it may give uh, even higher uncertainty in terms of the timeline of the clearance. Exactly. So I think this point, the procedure change is very significant uh, and we expect more uh, mm -hmm. guidance to mm -hmm. come. Uh, there is also public interest in civil litigation. Uh, that's something that's uh, really catching the eyes. But uh, let's probably, uh, for mm -hmm. the sake of time, skip that. Uh, let's talk about the personnel changes yeah. and, and uh, what what's the new, at least reported, what's the new National Anti-Monopoly Bureau? Is that different from the existing Anti-Monopoly Bureau under uh, the, the overarching, the, the big agency, SAMR? Yeah, I think um, actually it's the uh, uprise of the status that makes a difference. So the agency has changed to the that sort of bureau level, um, I mean hierarchy, to the vice ministerial level, which um, signals that it has a high uh, higher right hierarchy uh, within the government body. And at the same time, we would expect with that sort of higher status, then they could have more extensive 
uh, staff, you might hope that uh, they have increased the headcount, allowing them to increase from 30 to 90 or even 100. And uh, in the recruitment plan that we have seen for the civil servants for 2022, we have seen that at least there are uh, 18 headcounts that will be allocated to A and B. So we believe that the resources will be increased and at the same time, uh, it will also increase its uh, status um, uh, within the government um, mm -hmm. authority, and so it would have higher independence, and hopefully that uh, I mean it could uh, operate more efficiently uh, and can cooperate. Um, I mean with other authorities, which from time to time mm -hmm. they have to do and, so. And let me just provide a little bit more background. So this National Anti-Monopoly Bureau, uh, it's, it's essentially not really uh, a structure of a whole new agency, but it's expansion and and um, empowerment of of the personnel that's ha handling. Mm -hmm. The cases, but uh, all signals, perhaps, uh, Janet, uh, you may, you may, uh, I, I don't think we disagree on this. This is all signals pointing to more enforcement. Is that right? Mm, yeah, that's right. And uh, we believe that with more resources, high status, the enforcement, no matter whether it's merger review or investigations, uh, will, um, I mean, be be much more uh, focused and uh, mm -hmm. much stronger enforcement. But, uh, definitely uh, something to watch because it's really not clear uh, how and you know uh, the the new restructure would would affect the enforcement like exactly. And then let's go to I. This is really uh, a, a lot of like whole topics that we want to co cover, but uh, let's just go to several major ones. So we we've observed. Uh, the Chinese antitrust um, uh, uh, the, the agency is really uh, trying to push out more regulations, very much targeting tech, uh, targeting platforms. And then uh, what does that all mean for, for like, you know, uh, for business, uh, for Chinese business and the business outside of China? So uh, what have you, have you observed? Are there more cases ever since the, these uh, new regulations and, and even like, you know, just the announcement of their intention to enhance the enforcement? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, still the main focus. So other than, um, I mean, uh, near the end of uh, 2021, you were seeing the online platform guidelines. Uh, and then in this year, you have seen a lot of, uh, I mean, that's sort of investigations uh, focusing on online platform company. Um, so we see that same, for example, uh, the Alibaba case, uh, which uh, I mean, it has the highest amount of fine imposed, more than 18 billion uh, in the company. And then with, uh, I mean, Meituan, another uh, big online platform company, we're also talking about 3.4 billion. So I think the online platform company, one thing is that the government will continue uh, to investigate for any abusive behavior. And at the same time, you will see that there are um, a series of regulations uh, that are being issued uh, in addition to the online platform company guideline. For example, uh, I mean, there's uh, also a guidelines issued by uh, different provincial uh, or city governments. Uh, the Beijing government has published, published the one uh, on the 7th December for online platform company. And then the um, one of the most important province, Zhejiang province, has also published the one in August. And you will see that there are also a series of other regulations relating to the online platform um, operation, uh, including classifying the, um, I mean, the nature uh, and hierarchy of the platform has been issued. So we see in addition to antitrust, other regulations uh, also come hand in hand. Uh, so we still believe uh, that the online platform company, the high tech company, will still be the focus mm -hmm. of the antitrust and, enforcement. And it's apparently not the only focus, right? Uh, pharmaceutical fields it, uh, it remains to be hard uh, in enforcement. Can we uh, can we talk mm -hmm. about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. I think uh, what was mentioned is that uh, the traditional uh, business is still uh, the focus and uh, whatever that affects the daily uh, lives of the company, uh, of the people uh, that were subject to scrutiny as well. So we see that, uh, for example, uh, again, a very high amount of fine imposed uh, in a pharma company. Uh, Yang Zijiang, uh, which engage in RPM behavior, and at the same time, uh, for those abusive behavior, including one litigation which has brought against Sema, uh, I mean by three uh, API uh, companies, because Sema also, uh, I mean, imposed a high fine on them uh, and using very narrow market definition. Uh, so you will see that the pharma industry is also uh, the main focus. 
but probably, uh, I mean, the number of investigations are not as many as online platform, and the amount of fine imposed mm -hmm. is not as huge. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, it's still the and main focus. Connecting to a previous point that we talked about uh, the empowerment of the National Animal Monopoly Bureau, which is the central government equivalent <laughs> to the federal level here. And then that's not the only enforcers we're talking about. There are also uh, provision uh, level agencies. They're also on the radar. Uh, can we talk about that? Is there more coordination between the central provision uh, law enforcement agencies and, and what ha have been their enforcement focus? Yeah, thank you. I think this is a very good and important point because of the um, I'm restraint of resources in the central uh, SAMA, uh, the AMB, and uh, that's why uh, it has already provided a lot of trainings and coordination with the uh, local uh, antitrust enforcement agency. Uh, and at the same time, we have seen that more cases are actually initiated by the provincial level enforcement agency. What we understand is that uh, they would have the authority to initiate their investigation. They will report that to the, sem uh, to the central AMB uh, and then they will uh, coordinate among themselves uh, before uh, the investigation and also before they conclude an investigation. So there has been very close coordination uh, between them and at the same time you will see that there are also cross-ministry coordination. So in other words, even with just antitrust investigation, it may also have the support from, um, I mean, uh, taxation authority, uh, the network information authority like MIT uh, and other related authority. So we see that there has been strengthened uh, coordination among uh, various mm -hmm. governmental mm -hmm. agencies. So uh, definitely a lot, a lot is happening there. And we have talked about uh, several cases that has, has seen uh, fines and, and really uh, very much targeting at the behavior that's, uh, that's now prohibited. Let's let's go to the cross jurisdiction comparison a little bit. So over the years of your practice, um, you have seen literally right the 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 birth of the law and and then the birth of the agency and the merge of the three agencies and now uh, the elevation of the AMB. So what what have you observed? Uh, let, let's let, perhaps if we want to put things into main buckets, one is changes to the law and regulation itself, and then second enforcement. Uh, what are the main changes that you have observed? Let's go to the law and regulation first. Yeah, I think um, in terms of the laws and regulations, uh, you will see that, uh, I mean, the antitrust law was actually mm -hmm. quite a short legislation. And so there has been a lot of that sort of uh, uh, guidelines regulation issued by uh, SEMA, uh, but in the past, uh, NDLC, uh, et cetera, uh, so that it has become a, a fuller, um, I mean, coverage in terms of all types of behavior and together with merger. Uh, and you will see that, um, I mean, the agency are trying to uh, consolidate and uh, every few years they probably will, uh, I mean, uh, uh, review uh, all those spread out regulations and then consolidate that into one so that it's easier for you to follow. Uh, and at the same time, you will see that there are a lot of uh, that's, uh, regulations or guidelines that actually they are learning from other authorities. Uh, and the, uh, one of the most important one mm -hmm. is probably the European Commission. So we see that uh, the guidelines like the automobile industry, the intellectual property, the horizontal um, cartel agreement, uh, and also the commitment of the undertaking, etc., uh, and including certain concepts like the uh, passive sales, uh, the cross supply, etc., for vertical restraints. Um, quite a lot of them are actually, um, we will say that, um, I mean, uh, learned or by reference to the um, I mean, European regime. Uh, while at the same time, of course, it has uh, its own uniqueness. But I think, uh, I mean, what's happening in other jurisdictions, including, say, in U.S., uh, the digital platform uh, enforcement also would have, uh, I mean, quick uh, impact mm -hmm, to the Chinese mm -hmm. enforcement as and well. And then uh, definitely more regulations and then similar to EU, but not so much, I guess, with, with the U.S. Uh, targeting tech and automobile industries. Uh, there is no. probably just going to be more, and that's definitely a space to watch. And then what about enforcement? So uh, let's make a distinction here. There is public enforcement and a private enforcement, right? And, and up to this point, we have been talking about public enforcement mm -hmm. only. Uh, let's go to uh, private then. So, so what, what's private enforcement like in China? Uh, civil lawsuits? Are there companies filing uh, cases in courts challenging perhaps mergers or conduct of their competitors? 
Yeah, thank you. I think that's a, a very good question because we have seen uh, the trend has changed. So uh, I think probably in the first five years or so uh, after the antitrust law was effective, you will see that there's a small uh, litigation actions by individuals. Uh, and uh, we always say most of them, they were probably frivolous. But in the uh, latest few years, you will see that there are more uh, private uh, antitrust litigation and they are more serious. For example, uh, there's an antitrust litigation against Hitachi Metals, uh, which uh, they talk about technical antitrust issue, uh, like uh, whether there's uh, that sort of, a, um, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, abusive behavior and whether, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there's an uh, essential facility, uh, I mean, uh, by Hitachi Metals and whether that's uh, they have abused it, the dominant market position by refusing to deal with the four plaintiffs there. And so uh, this action has taken a long time. Uh, uh, it was initiated in 2014. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, uh, the plaintiffs lost it. Uh, and now uh, the, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, Hitachi lost. It. And so the development was that it was filed mm -hmm. an appeal with the Supreme People's Court. Uh, it was just uh, had the first hearing. But you will see that uh, it's catching a lot of attention. And the Supreme People's Court uh, has uh, taken it very seriously. Um, so that's, uh, I mean, an eye-catching case. But at the same time, you will see the uh, big companies, they also fight against each other. And uh, one of the most famous one is uh, Jingdo against uh, Alibaba. Uh, so they are serious competitors to each other. Uh, and you will see that Jingdu has initiated an antitrust litigation against Alibaba uh, and its uh, domestic platforms, uh, Timor. Uh, and the companies are fighting to each other and the uh, lawsuit is ongoing. So we see that there are more serious cases that they are actually talking about the antitrust issues. But I think the most eye-catching one mm -hmm. uh, is the one that I've just briefly mentioned, is that uh, in the past, uh, there's no that sort of a litigation action uh, which, um, I mean, mm -hmm. try to revoke the SEMA decision uh, through private litigation. But lately, we have received the one uh, in April 2020, uh, which SEMA uh, imposed a fine on the three mm -hmm. uh, API uh, companies, uh, which uh, now they are not happy. Uh, they said uh, SEMA had uh, uh, insufficient evidence uh, to prove that they have market dominance and have abused the behavior. And they also question uh, the principles that SEMA has adopted and the penalty imposed is too high. So it's the first case uh, which, I mean, uh, that sort of companies uh, are actually, actually objecting to SEMA decision and brought it to the court. And at the same time, you will see that the court has uh, taken very serious uh, attitude. So it was brought from the lower court uh, in Beijing to the High Court of Beijing uh, mm -hmm. because the concept is uh, very complex uh, and the antitrust issues um, I mean, it's not easy to deal with. So we also are very keen to see the result of this case because it's challenging SEMA's mm -hmm. authority. That's very interesting to watch. So one more thing that uh, that's probably um, the, towards the end of our list now. So w arbitrability of antitrust and civil disputes um, is, is there is there something that's uh, I guess it's catching up? You were thinking other jurisdictions that that uh, arbitrability of antitrust civil disputes is something that's recognized uh, over the years, but but he, uh, here we're seeing that in China now. What's the latest development? I think the latest development is that uh, this is um, I mean uncertain mm -hmm. because there are conflicting court decision. Yeah, I think uh, in one court decision, uh, in the Supreme People's Court's decision in 2019, actually the court said that uh, the arbitration clause cannot exclude the Chinese court's right uh, to have jurisdiction over antitrust uh, civil disputes. Uh, so in other words, in that decision, the court uh, thought that they should have uh, that sort of jurisdiction uh, over the dispute, even though there's an arbitration uh, clause therein. However, in another case, um, I mean, in December 2020, the Supreme People's Court uh, said, well, I mean, the behavior actually uh, related to a clause in the distribution agreement uh, between Shell and another Chinese company. And the court said that, well, given that the clause stated very clearly that the dispute should be subject to arbitration agreement. Uh, so the court said that the Supreme People's Court said that the dispute uh, should be handled between the parties by arbitration. Uh, so there are two contradictory decisions by the court. 
uh, and so it seems that it's more like, for example, uh, like uh, another uh, court, um, I mean, a conflict with the uh, regulator, whether for certain behavior is legal per se or not. There are also conflicting court decisions. Uh, and so for this kind of arbitration, uh, whether, I mean, the, the court would have right, uh, even though uh, there's an arbitration clause. Uh, again, I think, um, I mean, it's uncertain uh, and it probably will vary from case to case. Yes, yeah, certainly a lot to watch, both procedurally and on substance. Um, we could probably fill yet another episode uh, with this content. But in the interest of time, we're going to pivot, uh, Janet, to some more personal questions that we like to ask all of our guests. The first is to tell us something about yourself that people wouldn't know if they only knew you professionally. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I think uh, there are two things uh, which I enjoy doing other than being a lawyer. The first one is that, uh, I mean, in the young, uh, when I was young, I actually organized a lot of that sort of charitable events, uh, especially in-house. And now when I started to work uh, in the firm, uh, when I became a partner in 2007, so I have been um, taking quite a lot of work uh, for pro bono legal service. So I would like to continue that and also some other charitable events uh, outside the world. Uh, the second thing is that I would like uh, to be um, the coach or the mentor uh, to the young people. Uh, so I have been uh, teaching at the University of Hong Kong as part-time lecturer for many years. And now I'm also teaching at uh, Peking University and also uh, Tsinghua University as a part-time lecturer. Um, so other than the uh, law papers, I also would like to um, share the experience and hope uh, I can help them to grow. being a community member and a lawyer. Um, so that that's great that uh, you're participating in both of those. Um, and Janet, any advice you have for young professionals who are interested in doing what you're doing? Yeah, thanks a lot. I think for young professionals now, they are much smarter and uh, competent uh, than the old days when I was in. Uh, but at the same time, I think they are facing uh, more challenges, uh, including you and Arana. I think, uh, I mean, uh, the world is very competitive. Uh, and has a lot of expectation on us. Uh, and I think uh, so uh, we need to be brave uh, to face all those challenges. But at the same time, I hope uh, we can uh, maintain our uh, passion uh, for being a lawyer. And lastly, I think most important is that, um, I mean, you will see a lot of focus on the tech side. So I think uh, as lawyer, even though we are very conservative, I think we still need to learn how to become innovative and catch up with the technology development in the world. Great. Um, and Janet, now our final segment, what we call the Curious Hat. And now it's time for the Curious Hat. Janet, your reaction to that was priceless. Um, could you pick a number one through ten? Maybe one. One. What do you do for fun in your free time, Janet? Wow, that's difficult. <laughs> Not a lot of free Nobody time in everything you do. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, mostly sleeping. Another thing is that I like <laughs> eating. So uh, each uh, Saturday or Sunday, uh, normally I will find a new restaurant uh, and uh, try to taste it. And I think um, another thing is, um, yeah, a very boring thing is that I like uh, watching uh, TV series, especially South Korea soap opera. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so I can talk to the young people more because of that. <laughs> yeah. That's great. What, what um, is the latest that you have watched? Um, the latest one uh, is um, the, um, I mean, I like to watch the historical one, uh, talking about the old kings and the old queens, oh. and uh, always talk about their beautiful love story, uh, but normally that's quite sad ending, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of platforms, is that, is that available on, on Netflix? Amazon Prime, <laughs> Apple TV, where, where, how do you watch that, Dan? <laughs> I know. <laughs> But yeah, so yeah, great. Great. Well, uh, Janet, thank you again uh, for your time today. And to our listeners, thanks for listening to this episode of Our Curious Amalgam. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam, a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the antitrust section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust.
You can learn more about our podcast at, at OurCuriousAmalgam.com. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at OurCuriousAmalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.